Hey there gamers, I'm Pruitt and this is Jim Davis and today's show is going to help you and your combat speed it up, make it a little bit more realistic, things of that sort because we're going to introduce some of our favorite house rules for combat on this WebDM. This episode is brought to you by The Devil Made Us Do It by our sponsor, Monty Cook Games. Available for pre-order now. Pull off the perfect heist by bending reality in this trio of games with absolutely no prep. The players are liars. Time-traveling agents from the future with the ability to change details about the past that shape the game. The GM and players work together to create their scenario and goal. Then choose characters, introduce complications, and you're already playing. This game is perfect for any table that loves heists, low prep play, and improv. We got to play this game in playtest. It's perfect for one shots, but the meta plot lines make for great campaigns too. And because it's Monty Cook, you know it's gonna be full of weird sci-fi awesomeness that your table will remember forever. Reserve your copy today, link in the comments and description. All right, Jim. Let's uh, let's have yeah. this little convo about some uh, about some house rules, about yes. things to uh, you know, you know, just change up the game, make it run smoother, make it run a little different, make it run mm -hmm. however you know, just to make it run the way the table wants to run the game, right? Um, yeah, yeah, certainly. This is a this is a time honored tradition of of uh, D and D players and DMs alike, you know, of, of mm -hmm. taking that game and tweaking it the way they want it to, especially for something as mechanically detailed as like combat, because then that uh, allows you to fine tune the game. And I think some people see house rules and the like as like, oh, it's evidence of there being a flaw in the system, or like you shouldn't mm -hmm. have to, or something. Whereas I come at it from like the completely opposite perspective, which is like, we get to <laughs> like, like, yeah, yeah, you get to tailor this game to exactly what you want it to by tweaking and the like, but that doesn't mean, you know, just unfettered, uh, alteration of the rules is going to produce, uh, you mm -hmm. know, perfect gaming sessions. You gotta go about it thoughtfully and, um, you know, the like, and with as minimal disruption as you can. So that's where yeah. I'm coming from with a lot of the house rules that I use uh, for fifth edition. Yeah, and the thing is, is D&D itself offers plenty of optional rules, right? And we're going to be drawing yeah, out yeah. some of those, but, like, those optional rules exist in a, you know, over there. And But if you take them and put them at your table and make them a standard thing, that's where it becomes a house rule. And so yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. That's, that's, that's where we're coming from this. So first off, let's start with one of our favorites. Uh, and it, and it, it's fitting to start off a... a conversation on combat with talking about initiative yeah. and ways to tweak initiative <laughs> um so yeah. so jim how w first off what's 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 a house rule that you use and 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 how does it how does it relate to the game uh, and make it better for you yeah so i find that that moment when you're uh you know the about to fight the you know the action's about to start the whole having to pause and everybody rolls their uh you know initiative and notes the result and then i've got to like put it in order and keep track of it and establish that order like even with you know table tents and tokens and vtt support i always find it like interrupts the flow of that moment and what i'm looking for is that from the minute danger is introduced, from the minute act, you know, an action uh, moment or a combat is introduced, that we don't break for that. And so I use a uh, initiative style uh, modified from Shadow of the Demon Lord uh, for Dungeons and Dragons, and it basically is there are fast and slow turns, and the order of initiative is PC fast turns monster fast turns pc slow turns monster slow turns and the difference between a fast and a slow turn is essentially are you trying to do one thing and one thing only then it's a fast turn and anything that has multiple steps or there's multiple resolutions to it like attacking more than once or you know moving to this position using your bonus action and doing something else then that's a slow turn and i find that even with new players who've never used this usually within a round or two of just saying, okay, are you taking a fast turn or a slow turn? Are you doing one thing or many things? And mm -hmm. then resolving it PC fast, you know, monster fast, PC slow, monster slow. And just to keep that pace up and, 
you know, the only thing that I do differently is at the top of every uh, uh, round of uh, combat, I ask if it's going to be a fast or a slow turn for each character. And that's about it. Yeah, because sometimes you just need to chug a potion right quick. And so that's when you just go, no, 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 fast turn, potion. Just, uh, yeah, do one you thing, need to just, hit yeah. points mm-hmm. or you, yeah, you need that effect, you know, because you realize, oh, shit, there's a dragon. Luckily, I have this potion at the ready, you know fire resistance exactly let's go and you exactly. get it in before yep. the breath weapon so yep. that's it, yep. i want to fire yeah, off one I, spell i'm not trying to move and do that i'm mm-hmm. not trying to do another thing i just am casting this one spell and yeah. uh, you're yeah, attacking it, from it hidden for as fast. a rogue yeah yep, yep. <laughs> it does it makes for very fast and fluid combats and it has sort of like some of the same advantages that say like popcorn initiative has or more like narrative style initiative has where you're just sort of go with the flow but it still has the turn-based rhythm and structure that makes Mm -hmm. D&D combat uh, work and you know and so I find it works uh, it works very well although it does take some getting used to you know uh, for players who are used to more traditional roll your initiative score and compare it kind of methods I mean and uh, and another another version of initiative that it takes a little getting used to uh, but one that I've used in the past is where you just do the us and them like somebody makes the initiative roll so you determine, does the party go first or does the bad guys go first? And that right. way you can, you but that way you can set up your combos. You can have the cleric hit him with a whatever, uh, or somebody hit him with a feeble mind. Then the cleric hits him with a banishment uh, or you yeah. know, whatever. But you can set your your thing up so that your party can can execute the way that they want to. Um, yeah. and, and, and again, it's the same thing where it takes a little bit to get used to, because again, people are used to, okay, who goes first? Now I go, well, I want to hold right, my action. Right. Can I do that so that he can do this? Well, now you can just do mm. that. And yeah. so, yeah. uh, that's, that's another kind of initiative, uh, house rule that you can do. Certainly. And especially if you're not using like a map and grid and minis and all that, right. You're not oh, using DT, then, then these are looser forms of initiative that keep the looser form of theater of the mind combat. Uh, in 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 mind, and I think they work really well with it. And like to me, side based initiative, where it's like I go, you go, is really fast. It allows for like those combo moves and and you know mm-hmm. coordination between team members. Um, and then it's also you know most DMs are going with all their monsters at the same time anyway, so it, it just kind of to me it sort of speeds things up in, in a lot of ways. <laughs> There's a lot of fights it, where. It, all the monsters yeah, exactly. going once it's, anyway. <laughs> yeah, instead of in the combat turn, you know, some allies go, the enemies go, then the other allies go. Let's just let's just get that and go who goes first. Because uh, yeah. it does, yeah, it does allow, uh, you know, everyone to kind of shine a little bit better in the right order. Because yes. uh, you want to get the paladin up front first with that aura rocking before everyone else joins them or something like that. Yeah, you know? yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't have to worry about the fact that 5th edition doesn't have a delay action or you can't really change your yeah. position in initiative order that way, although, you know, DM can easily do that for you. Um, but mm-hmm. uh, yeah, these sort of simplified initiative sim- systems really help. And as long as you've got players willing to be flexible in their understanding of the game and that, you know, when there's a battle map out, there's precision, there's, the, you know, mm-hmm. the turn structure, that kind of thing. When there's not a battle map, it's more like this. Um, then I think that you'll be able to really uh, benefit from these. Most definitely. Um, Another way you can benefit if you do take the initiative is to go on over to Patreon and follow us over there so you get a whole other podcast every week. Uh, I think you'll enjoy it, and we've got a good community over there, so check it out. Um, Next up, this is one that uh, some people might hem and haw if they found out that their DM was doing it. But <laughs> variable monster hit points and damage. Yeah. So, yeah. Jim, how, how do you do this in a way that uh, a PC, if they found out, couldn't be like, oh, that's just changing the rules midstream? Uh, well, so for one, the average values that are listed in the monster manual are just conveniences, you know, they, they that you know you can have any range uh within that uh die value as part of that monster statistic and that is why i like using variable monster hit points and variable monster damage because i understand that the using average monster hp and using average monster damage is there to speed things up and to keep the combat mm-hmm. moving at a quicker pace but i found from both a dm side and a player's side that it results in in like more predictable combats less swingy combats and 
I play Dungeons and Dragons for the swigginess. I play Dungeons yeah. and Dragons because it's, it has a D20 and it's wildly swiggy. And sometimes you have a streak of misses and sometimes you have a streak of good hits. And sometimes you fight a goblin and it's got two hit points and sometimes it has 11. And yeah. as a dungeon master, I like finding that out in the moment of play. So it's a huge hassle to have a big battle with a lot of uh, weaker monsters. And, you know, I've rolled up all their individual hit points ahead of time and I'm keeping track of them, which monster is which, who just got hit, all that stuff. So I, I dispense with all of that. I don't worry about uh, fixing that up for myself ahead of time. I just say, I have 12 goblins in this fight. And then when one of them is hit, I roll their hit points. So a goblin has 2d6 hit points, they just got hit. I tally again, I roll my two uh, uh, hit point die for them. And like, I immediately know, are they dead or how many hit points they have left? And then I write that number down and now I'm tracking it because that is a goblin who survived a hit and is, you know, is relevant. And I find it's very quick. It's very easy. It's really there for like low hit die or low hit point uh, monsters to like speed up those kinds of encounters. And like if I go any higher in terms of like number of creatures, I'll use a, a different uh, a house rule that we're going to talk about in a minute. <laughs> uh, but I find for like mid level fights, you know, the the PCs are outnumbered. Um, but it's not enough to, to justify the mob rules yet um, that this helps combat go really quick for tracking their hit points. And, and then I just roll their damage randomly because I like variable damage too. Oh, I like yeah. that swinginess. Uh, yeah. Yeah. R rolling <laughs> like because here's the thing. Uh, it, that's the thing I've noticed in, in fifth edition is a lot of people adopt just the average of everything. They add the average hit yeah. points uh, yeah. as a DM. Like I, I fell into it, too, because it's Fixed just easier. damage. Yeah. You know, fixed mm -hmm. damage. Is, you yeah. know, you take twelve every time. You take twelve from this person. You know, and yeah. it, it, it's one thing that I've changed in the last couple of uh, of uh, adventures that I've run in fifth edition, which was uh, I would roll the damage because come on, yeah. Like, y you might get a really good hit, you might get a crappy hit, and it it adds to the variability because uh, you never know because somebody's sitting there with three hit points left and they're like, well, I'm dead now, and you get hit up, you got hit for two. Yeah. What? No, you're not. You know, you got three like, yeah, I'm rolling damage over here. You know, it wasn't a good hit, <laughs> uh, you know. And so you, yeah. you can have a little more tension. Um, how, how else would you, is there any other way that you would tweak that? I, you know, I think that like you could easily do it where you have like a big HP pool and you sort of like subtract from that, but that's really getting into more like grouping monsters together into their own. And, and that's to me how I handle mobs essentially. But uh, for me, this one is, it's simple enough that I don't really tweak it. It's, it's more about mm -hmm. when to use it. And it, it's really there for fights with a lot of low hit point creatures um that you know that that's what qualifies for it if i start having to get like big numbers certainly by the time it's like triple digits i'm i'm gonna probably track monster hit points uh in a more traditional way that time instead of like rolling for them immediately but mm -hmm. who knows like sometimes there's a fight and <laughs> i don't know uh you know uh what monster i'm going to use until the encounter happens and you know it either flows from the narrative or a random encounter table and I, even then, I'm, I'm going to wait until the monster gets hit before I roll uh, its hit points because it's a surprise for me how strong this monster is, what, you know, mm -hmm. what kind of uh, encounter this is going to be. And like, that's just the style of D&D &D that I like of, of being surprised and sometimes you're in over your head. Yeah, I could I could see right quick uh, uh, a way to do a higher uh, uh, number of hit die monster where you just roll one and that's your average that you multiply by. Mm, yeah, instead yeah, of taking the average, too. you know, instead of taking the average, what a, a D10 is six. Well, you roll, mm, I mm. rolled a four. Well, it has eight hit die four times eight. It's 32, you know, instead of right. the, the, the normal average. Uh, but we've mentioned a couple times here, uh, handling mobs. Uh, and that's, mm. that's another one here. Uh, there's some rules for this in the DMG on page 250. Yeah. But, yep. uh, but handling mobs is something that uh, I find like in Cypher, there are specific rules for. And I really enjoyed that. And trying to port that over to D and D is is something that's like, yeah, why aren't why don't we do this more often when you have just a huge group of orcs? Yeah. Well, well what are those rules? Because I'm curious how it differs from from sort of how I uh, I handle them. How do you handle uh, mobs? So in a in a in a recent cipher game, like you know, uh, the party's getting attacked by like eight level two creatures. So they break uh -huh. up into four, two groups of four. And so since there's four of them, they're now level four creatures. You double it. And then, you know, if one or two of them die, now they go down to a level three group. 
and but they oh, they see. attack as that and do that much damage as these multiple creatures are attacking. So, you know, I could see something very similar where uh, in a in a in a mob of of monsters, you know, when they hit, you know, depending on what you roll, you're gonna like, you know, like the mob rules say in the book, you know, you they do X amount of damage based on what you roll, uh, because so many mm. of them hit. Um, mm. But Jim, how do you handle it? Yeah, yeah. So uh, well, the way I like to handle it is is a, a combination of those rules that are in the DMG and then a, a, what sounds like you're doing with Cypher, which is like mobbing them up and grouping them up. So the rules on page uh, 250 of the DMG are there to, to reduce the number of dice you have to roll when you have a large group of creatures. And I really like encounters that have like you know dozens if not hundreds of other creatures in the in the background and sometimes the foreground fighting the uh the pcs so this is really handy for that the chart there lists the minimum die roll that the creature would need to roll to hit a creature right in this case one of the characters and then it uh, corresponds with how many creatures uh it would take to actually deliver that attack so that you can just say like well i've got like 50 enemies in this uh, mob of creatures and so i know that for every x number of them this is that's how many it's going to attack and so they just deal damage you don't have to make attack rolls for them and i find that mm -hmm. that speeds up combat uh considerably when you don't have to make attack rolls and you just assume a certain amount per uh size of the mob uh hits and then uh one of the modifications that i make to that is to then just pool all of the creatures hit points together and treat them as one creature that occupies a much larger space. And then I note like, okay, for every eight hit points or for every 20 hit points or whatever, that represents one of these creatures being killed. And it just simplifies things a lot. I'm not having to roll a bunch of attacks. I'm not having to like take dozens and dozens of turns or whatever. <laughs> it just treats it as like one group of uh, creatures is one monster. It has this many creatures in it. So this is how many of its attacks hit automatically. And then I just look up its damage, and I, you know, I still roll a, a variable damage for those. But uh, I find it speeds up combat considerably, and you can have like combat in, in mid-level D and D where you're like upper tier two or into tier three, and it's like there's a hundred of these, you know, bandits coming after you, or you've upset an entire village of of these creatures. Mm -hmm. Like they're all coming after you. And it doesn't completely bog down play. You can have that moment and it's fast paced and it's still a threat to the PCs because they're automatically getting hit. Um, and it doesn't take forever. Uh, mm -hmm. So it, I, I find it's very helpful in those moments to use that rule. Yeah, and it cuts down on how many times you could possibly get crit by enemies. So PCs should love this. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There are no, yeah, yeah there's no way to these... deal uh, crits with yeah. that <laughs> yeah let me roll these 12 d20s oh you got critted on yeah. five times you know make a new character um absolutely uh, yeah <laughs> but yeah like and, and and when dealing with mobs like this uh you know uh how would you how would you handle uh you know that mob getting its ass kicked and possibly fleeing which dovetailing into our next point here of morale yeah. which is to me like i love using morale i'm sorry it just yeah. it to me it reflects i know we're not going for realism but it reflects more of a realistic reaction to sure. pcs just curb stomping the first few enemies um if the re yeah. the remainders roll that morale like up oh, yeah they're they're bugging out <laughs> they're, they're leaving exactly. they're not having any part exactly. of this <laughs> so for me like it morale and and uh the both variable monster hit points and damage like they really speak to me of why i use these house rules and that is to expand the variety of experiences we have at the table i find mm -hmm. that like a lot of times when i when fifth edition gets stale or just well, any game really gets stale it's because like subconsciously or without really thinking about it or whatever we've cut off certain options for ourselves and so fifth edition combat can be one of those when i find that every fight is to the death with the enemies that there's never any talking there's never any parlay there's never any follow-up then that's when i feel like i've stopped playing a role-playing game and i'm playing something else and so morale is important to me because when i'm a dm i'm trying to portray this living world that the players can understand and learn and then interact with as they go about their adventures 
And so, like, not every NPC wants to die for, <laughs> you know, wants to sell their life dearly, dearly against mm-hmm. these uh, heroes, you know. And sometimes they're going to run. And I find that the the guidelines on page uh, 273 of the DMG are pretty handy for that. Um, there is a 2D6 morale system that D&D used to have. But I find more and more that I default to 5th edition's morale system of just making a wisdom saving throw. Um, because then at the very least I don't have to come up with like a morale score for every monster uh, on the spot. And I can just use the existing stats uh, in that way. Mm-hmm. And they're good guidelines, right? I think that it's very um, helpful to have like, all right, they might flee when surprised or reduced to half hit points or fewer for the first time. They might, you know, if, if they cannot harm the enemy at all, uh, they might test for morale. And then it's mm-hmm. like other ways, you know, that they might, or, you know, if their leader is hurt or incapacitated, or if more than half of their allies are, you know, gone or something, <laughs> gone, dead, uh, you know, like. <laughs> their allies have passed. One, right, like, what are you thinking of? Oh, uh, they just, uh, I don't know what happened. They died. Um, you know, and that's a way to differentiate enemies, right? A group of kobolds mm-hmm. might test the first time one of them goes down, but a group of hobgoblins, like, they're renowned for their discipline. Like, you're going to be fighting them for a long time you got to take out their leader and a group of skeletons or zombies like they're never going to run like they might be weak but you're never going to force them to flee you're going to have to kill all of them you have to destroy them all Mm -hmm. and i i found like that variety really spices up my combats and i i really like morale is like one of my favorite house rules to to pour into pretty much any version of D &D, uh that i run but any game that has a lot of like combat in it Oh, definitely. I still use the 2D6 because I just I like that bell curve and I just adjust sure, yeah, the, yeah. the break point up or down based on how hardy they are. You know, it's like, yeah, no, if they if I if it's above a five, they're 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 still in it, you know, like just take that, yeah, that yeah. midpoint. Um, but uh, but let's let's move on to our, our last one here, which is which is one. I don't know. I to me, it's like I want to get back to fifth edition because this is the death saves is the one thing yeah. for me. I've played enough games and had watched people go down and play the freaking whack-a-mole, like hop up, get knocked down. You know, it's like Chumbawamba. And, you know, that's that song is in the past. We need to leave it in the past. So uh, a rule that I want to use for, for death saves is you get one. You get one. Uh-huh. And whether it's after X amount of rounds, like I would say uh, rounds in con mod. So if you have a 14 con, you got two rounds before you make that death save. And it's a one and done. Like you live or die you make the save but your allies have that many rounds to stop you from bleeding out to to get you get there at least do some healing or a heal check uh medicine check um Mm -hmm. but uh also i can see just wait till the end of combat you're down wait till the end of combat you get your roll and you're either stabilized or or that's it because it's just my my last character death antonia really just annoyed me because i took it to the fifth roll and it's there was just this this un like it wasn't a fun tension it was mm. strenuous and just like i didn't i didn't enjoy the experience of it and i just realized like i haven't really any character i've had drop i don't like the whole well let's roll this round roll for your life you know like i don't want to i don't want to be on this game show i didn't buy this lottery ticket i've already gotten knocked yeah. down you don't have to kick me while i'm down i don't know what do you think jim I definitely feel that like I I've recently played a character who I don't I mean I lost track somewhere north of the 30s how many times they'd like been rolled death saves you know like I, it was one of those things where I was like how many I'm gonna track how many and I, I, I so many I lost uh, track of them and I yeah I had I had all those experiences the five saving throws is this gonna be the last one the getting a 20 and and realizing that like I you know the monster goes next I'm, I'm better off like just playing dead to survive this what might be a TPK like there's yeah. a lot of moments that I've had with death saving throws and I don't to me like I'm not a big fan of of those moments. Like they weren't an enjoyable tension. A lot of times they were a, I would rather my character just not, you know, have died and I can get on with making a new one and finding out how I'm going to fit it in. than this state of uncertainty that exists. Mm -hmm. And I know that for a lot of DMs and players, like they like that and they, they even take it a step and like they make it secret so that the other players don't know how long, uh, you know, or where that character is at or with their uh, death saves. But I I can see that, like, 
yeah, when you're just sitting there and all you can do is roll this one die and it, it, it's not helping, you know, it's, it's not making the combat go any faster. You're not really contributing like in prior editions of D and D, if that happened, that character is cracking open a PHB and is engaged in making their character. And I don't know that I've ever seen a character or sorry, a player in that moment. Who's been like, not engaged. I think there's a worry that the players like, well, I'm not in combat, so I might as well not even be playing. But if they're making a new character to, to jump in as soon as they can, then they're looking forward. They're, 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 you know, exploring other possibilities for what kind of character they want to play. You know, this is assuming they don't want to just get their character raised from the dead, you know, which is an option yeah. as lowest as fifth on level, level. Yeah. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. like extending that state of uncertainty of, are they dead? Are they not? Let's make this save. Oh, there's a 5% chance you'll come back and whatever. It's not a fun tension for me. And so anything that like gets that over with quickly, I, I'm, I kind of like. Yeah, no. Uh, and, uh, you know, you might've noticed that this show ended a little bit more quickly. Uh, if you want something a little bit longer, we always have our WebDM Talks podcast. Uh, so yeah. hope you check that out. We usually answer some Patreon questions, things like that. Also make sure you like, subscribe, Hit that bell, leave a comment, work the algorithm for us. You know how it is. Hope you come back next week. Thanks. Mm -hmm.